With the amplifier finished and up and running, it is now time to do final assembly. So there are a few things we didn't cover in a previous video. First is biasing. So I biased the output tubes and they were good. Then after that I did a full power test and the amplifier put out 20 watts into 8 ohms, which is just right in the ballpark. Well, yeah, let's put it together. Fortunately this cabinet comes with cleats on either side so it'll support the chassis without it being in all the way. The nuts used in this case have the lock washer built into them. They're called kept nuts. They're very important so that I don't have to use a wrench to hold them in place while bolting up the chassis. This is what they look like. This last one by the power transformer is especially tricky. See how it looks. Looks like an amp. Now the reverb tank requires special consideration. The reverb recovery circuit is so sensitive that this could transmit feedback through the system very easily, just mechanically, just by having it inside the back of the cabinet. So there's a couple of ways to uh, take care of that. The traditional way is to use a reverb tank bag. Mine that I have an order hasn't come in yet. It was a special order through Next Generation Guitars. Thanks, guys. They don't normally stock them, but they made an exception for me. Thank you very much. But the kit came with these little springs. And these little springs, they recommend mounting between the tank when the tank is positioned like this and the bottom of the cabinet to isolate it between the cabinet. So that's, um, like I said, that's interesting. Probably works fairly well, but I don't like it. So it exposes the tank to the knocks and bumps of things being piled up in the back there. The cabinet is open to the air, which may allow dust and particles and all sorts of stuff come in. So while I'm waiting for the reverb tank bag to come in, what I'm going to be doing instead is come up with an alternate method. What I've seen used in other cases is use foam strips like this one. This is specifically for uh, sealing around doorways. You run this on either side of the tank. On the, that isolates mechanically the tank from the bottom of the cabinet and also keeps out any dust and crap. So we're going to give this a try. Correct orientation of the reverb tank inside the cabinet is important. If you get it the wrong way around, it'll buzz because of magnetic interference with the power transformer. So how do we know which way is the right way around? Well, you try it. I've seen a lot of stuff, but I never suspected that the quietest place to mount the reverb tank in this particular amplifier would be like this. That's a pretty inconvenient way to mount it. So what I probably will do is we'll leave it like this for now, just when the bag arrives, put it inside the bag, probably trim this down a little bit, and we'll mount it on this board like this, hopefully hum free. COVID free rehearsal space. So the amp's done. The owner of the amplifier is going to be coming around and have a look at it soon. But I thought it would run through with you the changes that we made to the stock amplifier and the changes that I had to make to the kit. Changes from stock. Remove the tremolo. 
added a post pi master volume equalized to match the stock response. Modified the eyelid board to accommodate this. Added a reverb dwell control with blocking resistor. Linked the preamp channels to get reverb on the normal channel. Added the stabilization cap of 0.0022 microfarads in the reverb return circuit to uh, improve reverb stability. Ground bus instead of a brass plate for grounding. Grounded at the input jack. The high current grounds are over by the power transformer. Upgraded the power supply capacitors, 22 microfarads instead of 16 microfarads. Used a 5U4GB rectifier instead of the GZ34. Approximately 30 volt drop in the plate voltage. It's 2 to 4 watts of power reduction, but more sag. Note that this particular tube requires more current, but that's okay. The Hammond transformer that we chose allows for 3 amps of heater current for the rectifier. So that's the changes from stock. Now, the changes from the kit, it's a long list. Chassis modifications. Drilled out the output jack and reverb tank connector holes. Drilled holes for the output transformer, reverb transformer, and bias adjustment pot. Surgery to fix the loose power inlet jack and eliminate the accessory output jack. Didn't use any of the phone jacks or plugs from the kit. Replaced them with switchcraft units. Did not use any of the phono jacks that were in the kit. Replaced them with Nutric uh, Rean units, which have an isolated ground. Didn't use the power input jack, fuse, or fuse holder. So the power input jack we replaced with a bolt-in one, the switchcraft unit. Uh, the fuse holder wasn't certified, so I pulled one from the parts drawer that had a CSA certification. The fuse in the kit was three amps low, but low. That's too high for a deluxe reverb. Should be one amp. Watch out for that in the kit if you get one. Make sure you use the proper fuse. Did not use any of the tube sockets to replace them all with belt-in units. Used belt-in tube retainers did not use any of the transformers slash chokes, replaced them all with Hammond units. Did not use the bright switches, replaced them with switchcraft units with the correct pan head screws. Didn't use any of the pots. After some analysis, I took them and threw them all away. So some of them were really stiff and some of them were really loose. Now it'd be a weird feeling from a customer's point of view. So got a whole new set of potentiometers. Did not use any capacitors that, that were in the kit. Used Mallory 150s and silver mica caps for all the low signal stuff. Upgrade the 1 watt power resistors to 3 watt metal film ones, including the 470 ohm screen resistors. Shielded all sensitive circuits. Mounted the reverb tank on foam instead of the springs that came with the kit. There's a bag coming. Balancing resistors on the heater supply. Upgrade the pilot light with extra insulation on the chassis. Change the cabinet corner screws to oval head. The stock ones were pan types, which is why they didn't fit properly. Use blue Loctite on all screws, in addition to the kept nuts. Use new old stock 6v6 open tubes and new old stock Phillips uh, 12A27s, and you can still buy those for a reasonable price. For 12AX7s, I used Tungsol, and number six screws on the doghouse cover, which were not supplied in the kit. Actually, I had to supply several 440 screws as well. And the final note regarding the Ted Weber kits, I don't think you should view them as a kit per se, you should view them as a big bag of parts. And the good thing about the Ted Weber kits is you can order them a la carte. You can say, okay, I don't want this, I don't want that, I don't want that. Get the things that are good, and then supply your own for everything else. Now some possible changes that we could make to the amplifier after the customer tries it for a bit. And that is, first is change the rectifier tube to the stock GZ34. This is less sag, but more power. We could tweak the reverb dual control a little bit. Now we also could tweak the reverb control. There's loads of reverb gain right now. It's kind of too much. And it might be a good idea to tone it down a little bit. I have some ideas about how to do that. Now, I haven't checked the part numbers, but I suspect the reverb tank may not be the correct one for the circuit. So that's it. The customer will be buying a little bit to check out the amplifier. Hopefully he likes it. And hopefully you enjoyed this video series.